So the first thing that we're going to do, oh, if you have a specific setting that you want to learn how to adjust, I'll put a, uh, an index in the video that goes to each of these tabs. That will get you into the right vicinity. And then you can just kind of scroll with preview in your, uh, on your desktop or on your phone to the correct section and then pick that specific setting. So, so you can use those, those tab indexes to cut your search time significantly. Hello everybody and welcome to this, my third video on the Canon EOS Rebel T7. In this video, everything that we're going to do is accessed by hitting the menu button. So let's get exit out of this. And now you can see if I hit the menu button, we pull up the menus. I'm currently set in manual shooting. As you adjust the mode dial up here for different shooting settings, these options change. Manual gives us, in so far as I know, the most options for still photography, so I'm set to that. If you're in a different mode, you will probably see, like some of the scene modes, you'll see fewer, maybe only two of these shooting mode menus. After we go through the shooting modes for still, we'll then do the same for video before moving on to playback and settings in my menu, because when we move into video, these options in the red ones change. Now, if we look along the top, there are four different shooting mode menus. One, two, three, and four, which is live view. You can tell by the number of blocks next to the camera symbol. These are playbacks one and two, settings one, two, and three, and my menu. And we can scroll through the tabs by using left and right on the function button, on the uh, cross pad rather, right here. And once we're in a menu that we want to access, we hit the down button or the up button. I'm sorry, we hit the set button. Nope, it was the up button. It's a little bit hard for me to see in the lighting where this red uh, indicator is. We hit the up and down button to select the setting that we want, and then we hit the set button to access the specific setting, and then the menu button to back out of it. So that's how we're going to navigate through all of this. We're going to start right here with what is actually called camera one with image quality. These are the different image quality settings. And the image quality settings will be based on how you want to edit your images and the type of workflow that you have. The, the, the settings with the symbol and, the, and the, the letter are all JPEG only. So that smooth, like pie-shaped thing means fine, large. It's a 24 megapixel, which is 6,000 by 4,000 pixel image with minimal uh, compression and loss. This is coarse, same image size, but more JPEG compression, so you'll have some JPEG artifacts, which will reduce image quality. Medium is a little bit smaller, fine and coarse. Small is even smaller, fine and coarse, and even smaller and even smaller. This directly affects how many photos you can put on your memory card. Memory cards now are not all that expensive, so you can keep it in one of the larger settings if you just want to shoot JPEGs, and still have plenty of space for a relatively affordable memory card price. Okay, one thing about the medium and the small settings is that they use the full sensor and then they downsample to reduce the image size to a smaller size. You cannot re-enlarge them. Once it's a smaller size, you've lost the data in the larger size, you cannot get it back. So if you plan on printing these at any kind of size larger than say four by six, I'm going to recommend, at minimum, putting it into large fine. Raw plus large fine takes a raw file plus a JPEG of the highest quality, and raw takes only a raw image. So if you want to get the most out of your images and you're interested in doing some editing on your images on the desktop, you'd probably just want to leave this in raw. Raw plus JPEG made sense on previous versions of Windows because the previous versions of Windows, like 7, could not display a thumbnail version of the raw files. Windows 10 and 11 can. So if you have a current version of Windows, the raw files will show a thumbnail in your Explorer view, and there's no need to keep a JPEG as well as just the raw file. So in general, if you're going to be serious about doing some work on your images to get the most out of them, shooting in just raw is going to give you the best results. Beep, enable, or disable. Do you want your camera to beep when it does things or not? 
up to you, personal preference. Release shutter without card, enable or disable. With enable, the shutter will fire if there's no SD card in the camera, which is a good way to uh, think you have an SD card when you don't. If you set it to disable, the camera will not take a picture without an SD card, so a really quick way to check and make sure you have an SD card before you leave the house is just to take a quick photo, and uh, then you don't have to fiddle with the battery chamber or anything like that. Matter of personal preference and how much uh, you want to use that feature. Image review off to for eight seconds or hold. Image review is where the image that you just took is displayed on the LCD screen after you take it. Off means it won't do that. This is the number of seconds that it will do that. Hold, it will display until you tell it not to. It's a matter of personal preference how you want to use this, but in general, if you're getting this camera and you want to improve your photography, I would recommend setting this to off and then only manually checking through playback critical images that you really, really want to make sure you got right and not looking at the rest of them until you get home because that's going to teach you how when you're making mistakes and the consequences of making a mistake will be more severe because you'll lose a photo. So doing it this way will make the camera a bit of a harder teacher, but will improve your photography in the long run. Also, turning off image review will lengthen your battery life. Peripheral illumination correction is going to be on or off, basically, enable or disable. What that does is the camera knows that I have the Yongnuo 50mm f1.82 lens attached to it because the, the contacts tell the camera that. So it has a profile in the camera that says the amount of light loss to the corner of the image is this amount. All lenses have less illumination at the corner of the images than they do at the center that's just lens physics. There's no way around it. So what this does is this knows at each aperture setting how much light loss that is and it will amplify the amount of illumination in the image with algorithms in the camera to correct for that. If you disable it, you get a little bit less noise in the corner of your images, and you get to preserve the lens's image characteristic. Enabling it gives you more even illumination across the image. Just a matter of personal preference, how you want your images to look when you take photos with, with that, uh, each of the lenses that you have. Red eye reduction is enable or disable, and this applies to when you use your flash. Does the flash pulse or the autofocus light, depending on the specific settings, I forget for this camera which one it is, prior to the flash firing, which causes your human subject's pupils to, to shrink and reduces the red eye look, or not. Personal preference of whether or not you want red eye reduction. Flash control, right here. Flash firing is enable or disable. Do you want the flash to fire? Built-in flash function settings. So here are where we get to some of the flash settings. Flash mode ETTL. With, this is grayed out because I can't adjust it, okay? What this means is that with ETTL, the flash is going to use the light coming through the lens and the camera's light meter to take a meter reading and adjust the power of the flash, the shutter speed and aperture, if applicable for the mode you're shooting in, to give you a proper exposure. Shutter sync is first or second curtain. Now, if you remember from the vi second video when we talked about flash, we talked about the first curtain travels, it's open, and then the second curtain. First curtain sync means that when the first curtain reaches the bottom of the sensor and finishes its travel, the flash fires. Close reset. Second curtain means the first curtain finishes the travel, the sensor's open to light for some amount of time, and then immediately before the second curtain starts, the flash fires, and then the second curtain starts, and then they reset. If you're shooting at 1 200th of a second, or even 1 60th or 1 30th of a second, this does not matter. But if you're taking a 2 minute or a 10 second exposure, it does matter. What you can do with second curtain is have your flash trigger at the end of, let's say, a 10 second exposure. And in that time, you're in a dark street and you have a friend with some lights attached to them running through your scene. And then right here, the flash fires, your friend's illuminated, the shutter ends, but the lights that were on them show a trail of lights coming off of them through the rest of the image. So that's a, an example of how first and second curtain matter. If you're just taking really fast shutter speeds for portraits, 
does not functionally matter how you have this set and you can just leave it to first. Flash exposure compensation allows you to intentionally overclock or underclock your on-camera pop-up flash or certain Canon speed lights, maybe all of them. Uh, I, I do not unfortunately have an encyclopedic knowledge of Canon speed light flashes. And then ETTL2 metering, how do you want this to function? There are two options, evaluative and averaging. Evaluative means that the camera looks at the entire scene just like it would when you're taking a non-flash photo to figure out based on the illumination based in different areas, how the flash should be fired. The average means it takes data from the entire scene, averages all of that information together just like you would a stack of numbers, and comes up with a proper exposure based on that. The difference here is it evaluative if you have something like chrome in your scene or someone's glasses, reduces the risk of the flash creating a hot spot on those reflective surfaces in your image. But a matter of personal preference and how you want your flash to behave, honestly, of all the settings you can control, this one is the one that I think is gonna have the least effect on how your flash fires. External flash functions. Can't do it because I don't have a flash connected, but guess what? It's the same as the built-in flash functions, just for an external flash. External flash custom function settings these are going to be some custom functions you can set for certain Canon, I believe only Canon flashes, but since I don't even have one of those to demonstrate with, we can't get into that menu. If you're at a point in your photography where you're super serious about setting up your Canon speed light with these, the manual is going to be very helpful for that. Clear the external flash custom functions means anything that you set in here for those flash custom functions, you can erase. Next up is the the second camera menu. So first we're going to start off with exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing. AEB stands for auto exposure bracketing. So if we're just in here in this view, you can see that we have two options here. The wheel is illuminated, those triangles are not. We'll get to that in a second. I'm going to adjust the wheel. Nope. Ah, I know the problem. I was set in manual mode. And in manual mode, you cannot do exposure compensation because all you have to do, automatically, because all you need to do is adjust your, your settings yourself. So I switched over to aperture priority mode, and now you can see those triangles are illuminated. Now, if I push the triangles, what happens is that I can intentionally over or under expose the image by up to five stops in each direction. So if I want to do some high key photos, I can give the sensor more light. Or if I want to do low key, I can go this way, for instance. That's two examples, right? So if, if you have very tricky high contrast lighting, or if you're taking a photo of somebody in the shade with something very bright behind them, you can intentionally overexpose your image to really blow out the background, but get a proper exposure on the person who's in front of you. Okay, but I'm a little bit inexperienced in this. I want to, you know, I want to cast my net wide or, or make sure that I get the right right exposure without really trying to figure out which setting I need to do on the fly. Well, then you can go into auto exposure bracketing. I adjust the wheel and now it brings up the second line down here, which allows me to set, take three photos intentionally over or underexposed by up to two stops in each direction. So that when I take the photos, uh, it depends on the setting, the drive mode, whether or not you have to hit the shutter three times or hold it down to, to take three photos. But, um, that will take three different photos, one that's too dark, one that's properly exposed, and one that's overexposed according to the light meter on the camera, so that if you are in that same setting where you're under the awning with somebody and there's a bright background or a very dark background, you can get the correct setting automatically to have that person be properly illuminated. Auto lighting optimization. This is high, standard, low, and off. So what this is gonna do is you can think of this as being like HDR light. Low, standard, and high will amplify the shadow tones and reduce the highlight tones to give you less contrast and more detail in those dark and light areas. If you're shooting raw, this isn't actually gonna do a whole lot for you because you can do better controls in post on your computer in your raw files. This is really only going to affect JPEG images. It does 
add a little bit of noise to your shadows and can cause some weird color artifacting, at least in some of the older Rebel cameras with your highlights. But it does give you a flatter image straight out of the camera. So a matter of personal preference how much editing you want to do in post to recover shadows and highlights or whether you just want to shoot JPEGs and get them right out of the camera how you want them. Metering modes are evaluative, partial, and center weighted. So evaluative uses those 63 modes. In the first video I said this has a 63 section meter. So the scene that this camera sees is, di is divided into 63 sections. Using complicated maths that I can't explain, the evaluative meter takes information from each of those 63 sections and comes up with a meter reading that is accurate for the scene to give you a proper exposure. Partial metering is what we would generally call spot in, in the generic term. And what this does is take a very small part of the area of the photo, generally about, I don't have the percentage written down, but it's usually around six or something percent with Canon. I think there is a way in the custom functions to adjust the size of that circle. If so, we'll see that later in this video. And also, I believe you have the option to link it to your autofocus point. If so, again, we'll see that later in the video. And what this does is this takes 100% of the meter reading off a very small area. So if you're taking photos of people, you can have your exposure be set to the person's face. And then that will give you an exposure that's appropriate for the person's skin tone, in theory. If someone has extremely dark or extremely light skin, then this will not be the perfect setting for that. But for people who are, you know, generically pasty to tan, this will work just fine. Center weighted average is going to take the central portion of the meat of the, the scene, say an area about like this that I'm drawing with the pencil tip right here. And the majority of the metering data, you, I don't know the exact split with this camera, I couldn't find it, but it's usually in the 60%-ish range with Canons, will come from that area. The balance of the metering information will come from everything outside of it. So if you have a center-framed subject, or you're just doing general walk-around photography, this is a really good mode as well. Evaluative is generally the, the default, and I will give Canon a lot of credit for having very advanced evaluative metering on their Rebel cameras, especially their later ones like this. Custom white balance is where you can adjust the custom white balance on a that we, we talked about in video two. You can select that custom white balance that was way over here on the end. This is where you create that. What you need to do is have a card in the camera and take a picture of something white in your scene. So let's say you're doing tabletop photography in a white soft box so that you can sell things on one of the online marketplaces. What you would do is set up your lighting how you want it. And then you take a photo with the soft box empty and then you would be able to use that photo to create a custom white balance setup so that when you select that and you use that same lighting in your tabletop white uh, soft box, all of the lighting, as long as it's the same, delivers consistent images across your entire shoot so that the white always appears white. This is a really good way to prevent incidental white balance shifting, which can happen with with objects of different colors. If you say are photographing flower arrangements in a soft box and you have six different arrangements in there, purple, white, red, whatever, the, what, those different colors can affect auto white balance temperature in a setting like that. So this is a really good way to start off with a blank slate, create a custom white balance, and that will force your camera to ensure that the color tone on the subjects that you're photographing in that softbox setting are consistent across all of the subjects. White balance shifting and bracketing allows you, if you are just going to take a handful of shots and don't want to go to the trouble of setting up a custom white balance, to either, I know that I'm using very blue lights, I'd better add some, some amber color here to counteract that, or I want to take three shots because I'm not quite sure whether I'm using blue lights or orange lights. Let's take one of each. Center balanced, very blue, very orange, or maybe I need magenta and green because I'm not quite sure what color temperature the fluorescent bulbs I'm using are. So you can do this to take a series of bracketed shots with some adjustments for, uh, for color. 
Also, you can use this to shift over in other directions as well. So you can get very complicated with this. And you can also, by the way, use this to take still images that are just out in daylight with different color balances. And you can then have different images with, with different color tones to just see how they look in different lighting and for different creative effects. So that's something you can do with that. Color space, sRGB or Adobe RGB. S stands for standard. In general, unless you are super, super into the Adobe ecosystem, just leave it on S. sRGB can be recognized by any printer, any computer, any photo editing software. Adobe RGB, hit or miss. Picture style is neutral. Right now it's set on neutral. These are all of the different options right here. You can set your own monochrome, faithful, neutral, landscape, and portrait. So in general, this, by the way, is to the best of my knowledge, only affects the way that the JPEGs work. It does not have any effect whatsoever on RAW files. If you're shooting RAW, just leave it in neutral because it doesn't really matter. If you're going to be shooting JPEGs and editing them in general, as a good practice, leave it in neutral, potentially faithful. Neutral is a little bit more even toned. Faithful tries to have a little bit more contrast and color accuracy. With, with these, neutral is a slight preference for editing. You can always add contrast. You can always add color pop. It can be really, really hard, if not impossible, to remove those. So if you want to do some editing with your photos on your computer, leaving it in a neutral setting is going to give you more ability to have better editing results on your computer. Now we're back up to the top, so we're going to go over here to Shooting Menu 3, Dust Delete Data and ISO Auto. So Dust Delete Data, what this does is this takes a photo, you'll take your lens cap off, and you'll point this at like a plain white computer screen, just open up like your text editor, leave the, blank, the page blank and, and fill the frame with that white page, or at a plain white wall. And this is going to take a photo and it's going to use the data from that to find dust on the sensor, and then it's going to use algorithms to eliminate that dust when you take actual photos. ISO Auto, this is the maximum ISO that your camera will be able to use when you set it to automatic. So you could do 400 up to 6400, which is the max for the camera. But this way, let's say you wanted to use Auto ISO for general shooting, but you didn't want to have tons of noise. You could set it to 400 and then set your ISO to Auto and have a limited range of of ISO settings for your camera to choose from. Back up to the top, and that means we are now on to the Live View Shooting menu. So Live View Shooting, Enable or Disable. That is, do you want to be able to do Live View by pushing this button or not? Generally speaking, unless you are really short on batteries, it's a good idea to enable it. Live View is a very useful tool. If you disable it, you could also just force yourself to use this like a traditional SLR. Matter of personal preference, battery preservation, and how you want to use your camera for that. Autofocus metering in live view only are flexi zone, live mode, and quick mode. So flexi zone is what this is going to do is this is going oh, autofocus method, not metering. I'm sorry. This is the way that your autofocus will work when you are shooting only in live view. Flexi zone uses a smaller central area of the autofocus points, and then as something moves around them, it uses a, a small grouping of autofocus points around that active autofocus point with your subject to predict where that subject's going to go and track them. Live mode looks for faces and focuses on those, and quick mode is going to be the mode that the camera will use to figure out the quickest autofocus method, and it's just going to use that. Matter of personal preference, what you want to do, if you're something like a vlogger and you want to have yourself be in front of the camera and always in focus, you want to use face mode. Same thing also if you're going to be shooting uh, photos in live mode with of portraits or of your kids or something like that. Grid display, off one or two. This is live view only. So on the display, when you are in live view, do you want to have compositional aids? Grid one is called the rule of thirds grid. And that means you've got a line here and a line here and then two more horizontal and your rule of third points are where they intersect. And it can be a really good way to help you have rule of thirds uh, friendly uh, image composition. 
grid two is a, is a much denser grid with more squares. And this is really good if you want to make sure your verticals are vertical and your horizontals are horizontal. Matter of personal preference and what you want to see in your live view settings for how you do this. Aspect ratio three to two, four, three, 16, nine, one, one. If you are only ever going to shoot video with this camera and you want your stills to be very easy to be used for splash screens on your videos, set it to 16 by nine, then you don't have to crop anything out of them. Three to two is the full image sensor. Four to three is a little bit less than, and one to one is a square in the middle. So you can set your full, you can set your camera to have different amounts of image sensor use in your stills. As a general rule, if you're going to be focused, uh, if you're going to be editing, in post for your images, just use the full sensor. You can always crop 16 by nine and then adjust your crop up and down. But if you cut out everything outside of the 16 by nine area from your, from your image that's being recorded, you can't get it back. Metering timer is four seconds up to 30 minutes at these pre-programmed intervals. This is how long your meter mode will, your, your light meter rather, will stay on, and I believe that this applies only to live view shooting. It's just a matter of personal preference and battery preservation, although the, the meter doesn't really use that much battery. I tend to like 16 seconds, but again, personal preference. We're going to switch here to movie mode, and now we're going to go into the movie settings, and there are three of these, because we go back here to image setting one, and we've already covered all of these. So movie mode. Movie exposure, oops. Movie exposure is going to be auto or manual. Do you want your auto your your camera to automatically calculate the proper exposure for your movie or do you want to shoot movies in full manual mode? This is a matter of personal preference and how comfortable you are with manual mode and your lighting setup. AF metering we talked about. Autofocus with shutter button during movie, enable or disable. Do you want to have the autofocus work with the shutter button being half depressed when you're using your camera in movie mode. Matter of personal preference and how you want to have your autofocus work. Shutter button, shutter and auto exposure lock button right here. So basically what this does is how your camera is going to record uh, auto exposure and auto shutter lock. Let me grab my notes on this part. Here it is. We will again cover, we will cover this in the settings section for still images, but this functions the exact same way as those. AF AE lock. When you start your, um, when you push the shutter button, it will lock your focus and your exposure. This is really good for stationary subjects in predictable and consistent lighting. Auto exposure lock and auto focus will allow the metering and the meter and the focus to be done separately. So when you press the shutter button, it locks your meter, does not lock your focus. Auto focus, auto focus lock, no, uh, a, no auto exposure lock. What this does is the shutter button will lock your focus, but it will not lock your metering. So this one down here, AE lock AF, this is good if you have consistent lighting and moving subjects. This one down below it is good if you have uh, changing lighting and stationary subjects. Auto exposure, uh, auto focus on, uh, I'm sorry, auto exposure and auto focus with no auto exposure lock. What this one does is it's useful for subjects to keep moving and stopping repeatedly and the exposure is set as the video is recorded. It doesn't lock exposure. Highlight tone priority, enable or disable. This tells the camera whether or not you want it to expose to prioritize highlights. It's easier to recover shadow detail than it is to recover highlight detail. So this will cause shadows to be a little bit darker, but it will give you skies that are a little bit less blown out if you're in high contrast settings. Matter of personal preference and how you want your video to look when you get it back. The movie record size allows you to adjust the size of recording from 640 by 480, which is was cutting edge in 1994, at 30, 60, 20, uh, 24, or 30 frames per second. So these are your sizes. The highest quality is going to be 1080 at 30 frames per second. 
You could also shoot 1080 at 24. So 30 is NTSC, 24 is PAL, I believe, if I remember that correctly. You could also shoot 720 at 60 frames per second, or 480 at 30 frames per second. So those are your different options and what you want to use. You, it, it has a little bit of effect on how much space is used on your SD card. More importantly, if you're going to be connecting your camera to your TV to play videos back directly, you want to make sure you have NTSC or PAL selected correctly for your region. Sound recording is, you can see here, going crazy because I'm talking right now, is auto, manual, or disable. Auto means that the camera's microphone will adapt to the ambient audio, and if there's, something's quiet, it will increase the gain. If it's not, if something's loud, it will decrease it. Manual lets you manually set how sensitive the microphones are, and dis and you can see here there's that setting that I can use. Um, disable turns off the audio in its entirety. Okay, so leave it in manual. Recording level allows me to increase or decrease the amount of audio, and you can see the volume level as I decrease this of what's coming in through the microphone to the point that right now it's really only picking up pops and loud parts of the words that I'm speaking. But if I increase it, now it's going to increase the sensitivity. So in general, unless you have a really good handle on your manual settings and you're in a controlled space, setting this to auto is a good way to ensure that you have some audio when you record. Then the last one here is wind filter, enable or disable. Do you want the camera to filter out wind noise if you're outside to the best of its ability? Matter of personal preference and shooting location. If you're indoors, you do not need the wind filter set. Metering timer, we talked about, same setting there. Grid display, we talked about, it's the exact same as for stills. Video snapshot, disable, enable. Video snapshot, I believe, is a little uh, two, four, or eight second clip that displays like a moving thumbnail. I think that's how that works. Honestly, it's a function I've never used, so I'm going just off of what I saw in the manual. Video system, NTSC or PAL, so you can manually select whether or not you want to record for NTSC or PAL, which would uh, not change. I don't think the, the uh, it does actually, uh, it does change the um, frame rate, 25 and 24 instead of 30 and 24. That's it, PAL is 25, not 24. Anyway, we don't have PAL here in the US, so I can never remember. Anyway, NTSC 29.97 frames. Again, video system is going to be the location where you live, and the, uh, you just want to make sure it aligns with your, your settings. Exposure compensation, we've talked about. It's the exact same thing as with stills. You can make your, your video brighter or darker on purpose. Auto lighting optimizer, exactly the same thing that we talked about for stills, HDR light. Custom white balance, exactly as we talked about for stills, where you can take a little bit of a video under of a white soft box under fixed lighting to have your video have the same white balance as the is is needed to give your make your soft box white. So this is really good if you're doing your product photography and you want to have a little product video to show what your product looks like from all 360 degrees around it, just by rotating it and having the white balance on your video match the white balance in your stills without having to go crazy editing stuff in post. Picture style, this is the exact same as we talked about for stills. Standard, neutral, faithful, whatever it would be. If you're going to be shooting video in the same setting as your stills, you'll definitely want to just make sure that these are set to the same setting for, consistent, uh, for a consistent look across the board. So we're back now in stills mode. The rest of the functions in the menus here should be the same for all of the stills and video settings. So we're back at playback menu one, protecting images. Well, there's no card in the camera, but you can protect individual images, folders, or all of the, all of the images on your card so that they, they can't accidentally be deleted. Rotating the images will let you manually rotate images or select them to be automatically rotated for playback, either rotating them on the LCD screen or on the computer automatically. So you have three choices with this one. Uh, I believe it, let me grab an SD card. Instead of telling you what I think it does from memory, let's actually see. So this allows you to manually ro rotate your images that you have taken. 
Erase Images lets you erase images either, uh, you can select and erase individual images, all images in a folder, or all images on the card. Print Options, this is for if you print directly from your camera. I've never done that. I'm not gonna be able to go through and tell you how all of these different functions will operate, but you would need to uh, have photos and be, I think you also have to be connected to a printer, a compatible printer, in order for this to work. So this is one of those things, if you're gonna print directly from your camera, the manual is gonna be more helpful than I am for this. Photo book setup, same exact thing. This has to do with setting up a photo book from your camera for printing. It's something I've never done, and I'm not gonna be able to explain it to you. Creative filters are presets of creative filters that you can use on the images in your camera, so that if you don't want to edit them in post on your computer, you can apply some of these filters and then resave copies of them, of those images, with those filters applied. Resizing allows you to resize your images. You can always resize down. You can't resize up without image quality loss. Playback menu two is going to have some effects on how you um, interact with your playback menu. Histogram, do you want your histogram when you play back to display the brightness of the scene or the red, green, blue color breakdown? matter of personal preference and the amount of or type of data that you want to see in your playback. Image jump with the command wheel up here on the top is how does the command wheel work when you're in playback? Does it scroll through one image, 10, 100, through different times, I believe that's by date, different folders, just to and through movies, just to and through stills, or just to and through images that you have rated? Slideshow starts a slideshow, and rating lets you go through the images on your camera and assign star ratings, and that way if you have the wheel set to jumping just through rated images, you can just show people your best images and uh, not show them the ones that didn't turn out. Here in settings menu one, we have a few different options, and this is where we start to affect the functionality of the camera. Auto power off is how long Will the camera go without having any buttons pushed before it turns itself off? 30 seconds up to 15 minutes. I set this on 15 minutes for these videos. I generally set it to four or five for cameras that I carry around with me to actually use. This is a matter of personal preference and battery preservation. You can turn this off and the camera will just stay on once you turn it on until the battery is completely drained. This is the auto rotate that I was thinking we were at in the previous menu sec section. Auto rotate is on, on, or off. Do your images, when you see them on your screen of your camera, if you shoot in portrait orientation, do they show up auto rotated this way with a letter box on the side on the back of your camera's display? And do they auto rotate to the, to the portrait orientation on your computer or just your computer or not at all on your camera or your computer? Matter of personal preference, I tend to like this to be set to on for both because it does uh, streamline the photo editing process on the computer to have them auto rotate there and having your images properly aligned on the screen does make them a little bit easier to see and understand when you show them to people. Format card will format the memory card. File numbering, continuous, auto reset or manual reset. Continuous goes 0001 to 9999 before turning back to 0001. Auto reset will reset the numbering each time there's a new folder. And manual reset will reset the numbering right now when you tell it to. In general, I recommend leaving it to continuous because if you're gonna move files onto your computer, it's a whole lot harder to get 10,000 files on your SD card and start overwriting them on accident than it is to have three or four different folders that all start at 0001 and accidentally overwriting files time and time again. Selecting the folder lets you select which folder your images are going to be saved to. You can select one that's already there or you can create a folder. So let's say you're gonna go out on a weekend trip. You wanna create a folder for the first date, the second date, and the third date, that way you can save files from each of those days into that specific folder just for organization. Another example, you've got two shoots for clients that you're gonna do in the same day. Create a different folder for each client 
and then you can save their images into that folder and you don't risk accidentally sending photos from one client to the wrong client. Okay, the other thing you could do is if you have homework assignments, create a different folder for each homework assignment and that way you know which photos you've taken for each homework assignment as you're in your photography class. So there's some good uses for creating your own folder and saving images to that folder with this camera. Screen color is going to be a matter of personal preference and what is easiest for you to read in your quick menu. So white on black, easy to read in every single lighting condition. Black on white needs a bit more ambient light to be easier to read. This is white on dark brown it looks like. It's fine. And this is gold on dark brown or light, light brown on dark brown, can't really tell. That's not that easy to read, but this would be fine for a very dark situation, like if you're shooting astrophotography at night and you don't want the screen to uh, reset your dark adapt, adapt, adapted vision. But generally speaking, it's just a matter of personal preference, how you want your screen colors to display what you're going to do with this. Settings menu 2, LCD brightness, is how bright you want your LCD to be. So you can force it to be as bright as possible, which is really useful for daylight, or as dark as possible, which is really useful if you're at something like your kid's, you know, spring play. LCD on off button. This is the, the button set or button individual that will turn the screen on and off. With this first option, the shutter button turns your LCD screen on and off. With this button, the shutter and the display button will both turn your LCD screen on and off. And with this, the LCD screen will remain on. This is just kind of a matter of personal preference. The big difference between these first two is whether or not the display button works. Remains on will drain your battery, and it also means that when you put your eye up to the viewfinder, you'll have a bright screen just underneath your eye, which can also affect your ability to uh, see a scene uh, well. Date and time zone allows you to adjust your, your date, your time, where you're at. So you can, you can set this to wherever you're going to be. If you're traveling, you can adjust the, those accordingly. Language allows you to pick from any of these preset languages right here, or play pranks on your friends by giving them one that they have no hope of being able to decipher. Clean manually. What you can do here is this will lock up the mirror of your camera and your shutter so that you can get in there with, say, a bulb blaster, which is one of these things right here, that you can use to clean dust off of your shutter. You can also use a brush. I have a video, a separate video, uh, that I've uploaded some time ago that shows how to clean a camera sensor in different ways to get dust off of it. Feature guide, enable or disable, when we saw the quick menu in the second video, we would go to a thing and then this little text box would pop up here telling us a little bit about it. That, this is a thing that will help you learn what some of your different features do. Once you've learned them, you can hit disable and then you don't have that guide popping up in, uh, every time you use it. I don't have a GPS device to connect to this camera, so I can't really show you what those settings are. If you do have one of those GPS devices, the menu is going to be much more helpful than I can be. Settings menu 3 is going to start off with Wi-Fi NFC. The first thing we have to do is either enable or disable the Wi-Fi and NFC capabilities. So, in general, in the, for your own data safety, what you want to do is leave this to disable except when you are actively transferring files via your Wi-Fi or NFC to your phone. For, you can use either of those or computer, which will most likely be using Wi-Fi. The ability of somebody who wants to packet plant through a camera's active Wi-Fi or NFC uh, connection is way more sophisticated than this camera was designed to prevent. This was a 2017 camera, and even if it has the most modern firmware on it, that's going to get long in the tooth pretty soon. So. Um, there is always a cybersecurity risk when you walk around with an open data connection. So unless you are actively using Wi-Fi or NFC, turn that off. Wi-Fi functionality, if you have it on, this only, you can only access this if it's on. You can transfer images to another camera, to a smartphone, to a printer, or to a web service. 
Certification logo display displays the certifications that the camera adheres to. Custom functions we're going to come back to and look at at the very end if you have a specific custom function you need to learn about. Each of these is going to be linked separately in the, in the description with a timestamp so you can go right to it. Copyright information allows you to enter the, your name and this will save your name into the EXIF data of your uh, images. Enter copyright details. If you are taking photos on behalf of a client and they will own the copyright, then what you want to do is enter that client's information here and then their name will show up in the EXIF as well. That generally only applies if you are a direct hire employed by, the, by a company that is having you take photos on their behalf. If you are a 1099 freelance photographer taking photos of a company, uh, of a company staff for, uh, for a corporate photo shoot, at least here in the US, you still own the copyright on those. Clear settings will give you the ability to clear all of the camera settings, everything we've just gone through in the entire menu system, or just the custom functions that we're gonna go through at the end of this video. Firmware version 1.0.0 tells you that this is what firmware version this ha has in it right now. Uh, I forgot to write down the, the most recent or perhaps final version of this camera's firmware, but you can find it on the Canon website. Next, we're gonna go into my menu, and this is a menu that you can set up so that you can put the most common functions you use in it, and then you can um, access them more easily. So register to my menu allows you to put something in your menu. So we know we're going to use exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing often. We're gonna put it in my menu. And we also know that we're going to use the ISO auto function a lot. So we're gonna put it in my menu. We're gonna back out now and we can now sort. I know that I'm gonna use both of these, but I want to access ISO auto more often. So I can, using the set and the up and down buttons, exactly as we just were before, change the organization of my menu so that when we go into it, now these things, well, I did that wrong. No, I didn't. I did it right. <laughs> I misread the thing because I'm upside down. Anyway, um, we can now see the order of these is the way that we set it up and the menu items that we wanted are in there. You can then delete individual items because, uh, you know, I just found out I'm not using ISO auto all that often, so I'm just going to delete it. Or I'm really, I messed up the my menu completely. I don't want to delete them all individually. I want to start over from scratch. You can delete everything in my menu. This is the last my menu option allows you to start at the shooting menu, or if you click enable, you will jump straight to my menu every time you push the, the menu button. So that's a really good function to use to set up my menu to be a quick access for your most common functions. Now the last thing, <clears throat> the last thing that we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna go through all of these custom functions. We're gonna talk about what all of them are and how they affect your images. There are 11 custom functions on this camera. So I'm gonna navigate it basically the same way we use left and right to go through the custom functions. We then press set to drop down to the options and up and down to select an option and set to change it, okay? This first one, custom function one, is your exposure level increments, third or half stop. This is how accurate you want your meter and your settings to be. This, this is most important for manual mode, by the way. This is one third stop increments for aperture and shutter speed or half stop. If you shoot raw, this really doesn't matter. The raw files in this camera are pretty good and you have a ton of exposure compensation and adjustment latitude in raw editing. So basically, if you shoot raw, this come, becomes an option of how quickly do you wanna scroll through your settings. If you shoot JPEG, leaving it in one third can give you more accurate JPEG results. Custom function two is your ISO expansion off or on. Do you want to have a, an expanded ISO range. What this does, if you set it to on, we saw before it, in all of the ISO settings, it went up to 6400. With on, it then adds an option called high, which is 12,800 ISO. The higher ISOs have much more noise. Setting this to on is good if 
you're going to be do, doing something like astrophotography or star trails or night photography. And you want to just take a quick half second exposure just to make sure your framing is correct before you dial back the ISO to something like 200 or 400 and do a 30 second exposure. Custom function three is your flash sync speed in aperture priority mode. This only applies to aperture priority mode. No other of the modes on the mode dial up here are affected by this except AV. Automatic, 200th to a 60th or 200th. So what this does is in aperture priority mode, if you need to have a shutter speed that is longer than a 60th of a second, your camera is going to do it. If your shutter speed needs to be like three seconds to get a proper exposure even with your flash, it will do it. And this applies, by the way, only to when the flash is being used as well. Option one will put a governor on your shutter speed in with a flash in aperture priority mode of 1 60th to 1 200th of a second. And option two will fix your shutter speed in aperture priority mode at 1 1 200th of a second. So then the camera is going to have the ability to adjust the flash power in, uh, accordingly at 1 200th of a second to give you a proper exposure with your selected aperture. Matter of personal preference and how you want your camera to beha behave on this one. I tend to recommend leaving it at fixed. That's, that's the way I shoot. But again, personal preference for me and uh, how you want your camera to behave. How I want my camera to behave anyway. Custom function uh, four is your long exposure noise reduction off, auto, or on. All right, so what this does is apply noise reduction to long exposures. I don't have the definition of long exposure in this camera's uh, setting, you know, what, what it defines that as, but off turns off noise reduction, on turns it on. With this, what it does is it applies algorithms, and I think it might take a second photo as well to look for noise on your images and eliminate it. Matter of personal preference, how you want your long exposure photos to behave. High ISO speed noise reduction, standard, low, strong, or disable. Now, I don't have a definition of what this camera considers high ISO for noise reduction, but what this does is something very similar. It uses algorithms, and I, I don't think it uses a second photo, but I could be wrong on that, to look for noise in your images and eliminate it. And the more noise reduction you get, the, you'll, as you increase it, you'll get some reduction in image sharpness and quality. That's just the way that noise reduction algorithms work. In general, I do tend to recommend having this be disabled and then just trying to not shoot at very high ISOs to get the best results. Custom function six is your highlight tone priority. This is for shooting stills and it is not, not for video. We saw a video in the video op, uh, menu options. Disable or enable. What this will do is this will bias your exposure for highlights in your scenes. So if you have a lot of shots that you have skies, for instance, or bright lights, this will bias your exposure to give you a slightly shorter exposure so that your highlights don't get blown out. What that means is that if you shoot raw, this is a really powerful tool because it is much easier to recover shadow data in raw than highlight data. So this will force slower shutter speeds in settings with bright highlights so that then when you go back and edit your raw files, you can pull those shadow details out of your images. But matter of personal preference, I know a lot of photographers who swear by this setting being enabled. Custom function seven is autofocus assist beam firing. And there are four options, enable, disable, enable external flash only, or IR, AF assist beam only. Okay, enable, if you remember from the first video, we saw that light on the front of the camera up here, and that's your autofocus assist light. Will that light turn on if your camera needs more light to allow it to autofocus reliably? Yes or no? With no, it, you will never get an autofocus assist light no matter what. With two, if you're using an external flash that plugs into the hot shoe up here that has the capability to provide a steady state light for autofocus capability or possibly pulses, I'm not entirely sure how the speed lights do it because I don't, I don't own any speed lights. At any rate, if you haven't, this applies only to using an external flash with the capability to provide an autofocus assist light. 
And then this one applies, I believe, only to external flashes with an infrared beam on them. So if you have one of those flashes, this would, and, and use it often, this would be the one to use because it would be much less disruptive in a dark space. Custom function eight is shutter AE lock uh, button, button function. So we went over this in the video section, but this is, so, and this is specific to how it works for stills. What it means is that in option zero, the exposure locks when the focus locks, and that's fine most of the time, but it has, it, it, it fails if you have a moving subject that's running through different lighting conditions. Oof. So this will work very well if you're taking portraits of photos, of portrait photos of people under steady lighting, for instance, that would be a case where this is a good option. If you're at a soccer game where there's some trees casting light on part of the field, that's a very bad option. Option one is AE lock and autofocus. And what this does is this allows metering and focusing to be done separately. With this option, the asterisk button right here is what controls your autofocus. Half pressing the shutter button is what controls your auto exposure. So basically what you would do in this mode is you would use the asterisk button to focus and then when you go and press the shutter button to take the photo, that's when the camera is going to lock in the exposure settings. Option two is AFL, no AEL. And what this does is this works in auto focus servo, servo mode only, I believe, where the asterisk pauses the autofocus operation so that this changes the function of the asterisk to pause autofocus stopping it. Now, the case for this, oh, let me finish just a second. Then also, um, there's no auto exposure lock. So the ex auto exposure is locked when the photo is taken. So the case for this is, let's say you're at that soccer game again, and part of the field is in shade and part of it's in light. And with the way you're sitting, there's like a large uh, uh, support for the grandstand or a lamp or something like that between you and part of the field. And as you're following the action back and forth, you can use this to start and stop autofocus every time you get to that obstruction that's in front of you so that you don't your camera doesn't accidentally focus on that obstruction and make you miss a couple of shots. It could have potentially been really good. And because the lighting is different, then the exposure will be locked when the photo is taken. Option three is uh, eight auto exposure with auto focus and no auto exposure lock. And this is a good thing to use when you don't want to use the asterisk button, but, um, and for subjects that keep starting and stopping repeatedly, like kids or pets, for instance. So this is a good general all around shooting mode as well. Custom function nine is assigning the set button right here, a function. By default, this has no, uh, no function except working as the set button. This, this right here is only going to affect what the set button does when you are outside of your menu system. And if you recall from the second video when we talked about this, I pressed it and nothing happened because this was set to zero. If you set it to, to, button one, to option one, pressing the set button brings up your image quality selection so you can change between JPEGs and raw file formats. Two is your flash exposure compensation, which will allow you to bring up your flash exposure compensation settings so you can intentionally increase and decrease the power of your flash, both the pop-up and certain speed lights. LCD monitor on and off gives the set button the same functionality as the display button. Depth of field preview stops down your aperture so that in your live view, I'm sorry, live view in the, the LCD screen or your optical viewfinder here, you can see what the depth of field in your image is going to be like. That is the only way with this camera, by the way, to get a depth of field preview, unless you have a lens with a button on it. I don't recall, I don't know enough about Canon's uh, lenses to recall if they have that on their lenses or not. So at any rate, matter of personal preference, but the LCD on off is a duplicate functionality of another button on the back. So I recommend not using that. I do like the idea of it being a depth of field preview button because it's the only way to get that on this camera. Flash button functionality has two different functions. 
do you want the flash button to raise the flash or to allow you to adjust ISO? The ISO button already has access right here, so there's not really a huge benefit to having your flash button do that instead of raising the flash. If you only shoot in the scene modes, however, and your flash raises in, on its own automatically, then you, having the flash button isn't going to raise the flash, doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So this is a matter of personal preference about how you want your camera to function and how you use it. And the last one, option 11, is your LCD display when you turn on the camera's power. So on or previous display setting. What, with option zero, what this does is every time you turn the camera on, the display is going to turn on. With option one, it will only turn on if you powered down the camera when the, uh, with the LCD on. I personally like this being set to option zero because that way you know every time you turn your camera on whether or not the battery's got life left in it. You can also, at a glance, see how much life is left. And it just confirms that your camera has turned on. So, personal preference, but strongly consider leaving that at zero. And that's all of the custom functions and all of the settings. That is everything that your Canon EOS Rebel T7 can do for you as a camera and how to use it to the best of your advantage. Thank you everyone for watching and I will see you in the next camera manual video series.